I'm Jim Schaefer, the producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is William G. Bowen, who is here to discuss the book he co-authored with Derek Bach, The Shape of the River, Long-Term Consequences of Considering Race in College and University Admissions. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a great book. People are already talking about it. Thank um, you. Uh, well, as we begin, I wanted to welcome you to Rip Rap uh, and to thank you for taking the time to appear on the program to talk the, about the book you co-authored with Derek Bach. The first part of the title of your book, The Shape of the River, comes from a quotation by Mark Twain from his book, Life on the Mississippi. Could you explain why you use that particular metaphor? Uh, as we thought about the process of nurturing talent, which is really what the book is about, uh, we thought that that process is much more like the passage down a river. Uh, swamps, bluffs, tough passage, was, as well as bright, shiny days. Not always predictable, tributaries. Uh, that's an image that for us has much more to do with how people grow up and develop than does the flow through a pipeline, which is the image that one often, uh, often hears. Uh, also. Uh, I think that the river, and the Mississippi especially, uh, evokes all kinds of images uh, that say something to people. And they say something about the path of the country uh, through a tortuous uh, territory. And so it just seemed to us um, to feel right. If I remember correctly, Mark Twain really put an emphasis on knowing all the parts of the river, the heights and depths and, yes. and where the eddies were, and you had to know all those parts if you're going to be a good pilot. As we say in the quote that opens the book, uh, Twain's asking, do I have to know this river, every twist and turn, as well as I know the hallway in my house? And the answer is no, you have to know it better. Wow. <laughs> And that brings to mind that one of the exciting parts of this is the database that was constructed. Then maybe you could explain how you did that and what was involved with it. You know, I, I'd be glad to. I should say that the motivation for the book was to try to produce facts, produce some evidence that would be helpful in a discussion that's so often been shrill and focused on abstract propositions. And we thought, well, let's see how this process really worked out. And so we built this gigantic college and beyond database, which includes matriculation records of students who enter 28 academically selective colleges and universities, including the University of Michigan and Penn State and Tulane and Wellesley and so forth, at three points in time, uh, 1951, the fall of 51, the fall of 76, uh, and the fall of 89. And what we did for the 80,000 students in this database was enter all of their admission records. What did they look like when they were chosen? How did they do in school? Did they graduate? What did they major in? On and on and on. And then, for a large subsample, how did they do in what the coaches like to call the game of life? Uh, did they go on to graduate school? What did they study? Where did they go to school? Uh, what occupations did they follow? How much money did they earn? Uh, what's their civic and community involvements like? And how do they feel, looking back, on their own educational experiences? Uh, it's the combination of all of those elements uh, that makes up this really re quite remarkable database. What was it, 45,000 students? In just the 76 and 89 cohorts, and those are the two relevant to this particular uh, book because, of course, sadly, in the fall of 51, there were essentially no minority students uh, on these campuses, and so there wouldn't have been anyone really to study then. But of course, by the fall of 76, uh, there were large numbers, especially of African-American students, uh, on these campuses. And there was, what, 26 or 28 colleges, universities in this Right, group. there are 28, and they're a mix of privates and publics. There are four publics and 24 privates, but the weight of the publics is much heavier than that comparison would suggest, because of course they're much bigger. And so the four publics uh, contribute almost 40% of the students in the database. Michigan is a lot bigger place than Bryn Mawr. You might say that. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Certainly, yeah. you will understand that. And how did you and Derek Bach start working together on this project? 
Derek and I, of course, have known each other for many, many years. We were both involved at our respective universities working on these issues at about the same time. And uh, we sort of independently uh, came to the conclusion that it was really time to take stock. And I had been involved and was involved in the building of this massive database and had a good deal of experience with undergraduate education and graduate education in the arts and sciences. Derek, of course, has the great virtue, I think it really is a virtue, of being a lawyer and having been the dean of the law school at Harvard before he was president. And so he knew a lot about professional schools, law, medicine, business, with which I just had not had experience because Princeton is an arts and sciences university. And that brings up one of those phrases you talk about, race-sensitive admission policies. And as former presidents of two prominent institutions of higher learning, you both had first-hand experiences. Would you explain a little bit more as to what's meant by that phrase and its implications? Yeah. No, thank you. I, I would like to because it's a phrase chosen very carefully. Race-sensitive admissions means that race is taken into account in the admission process, but only as one factor among a great many factors. And students are chosen individually. Uh, Derek and I are both uh, opposed and have been forever, really, to quotas, set aside, separate admission processes. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about processes that choose individuals but that do consider the race of an applicant, along with the applicant's socioeconomic background, his academic qualifications, his interests, all of the other factors that exist in a folder. I was also fascinated with the depth of the analysis of your statistics, the regression predictions and so forth. Can you explain some of that methodology? The methodology is important, and we tried to present it so that readers would know what we did, but at the same time we tried not to um, obscure the common sense aspects of the study by a lot of high-tech stuff. So it was a matter of trying to find a, a middle ground, but the reason the multiple regression multivariate analysis is important is because it allows you to hold some things constant while looking at other things. I mean, for example, uh, we know that African American students come from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds on average uh, than do white students. And so there are times when you want to correct uh, for that difference. Uh, in comparing uh, results in school or after school of the two groups. What multiple regression analysis allows you to do is standardize for socioeconomic status, for gender, for high school grades, and so forth, while focusing on the variables that you're most interested in. We had, I should add, uh, wonderful help and advice, uh, technical help, from some very good people, and of course that was uh, invaluable. How does this play into what people call roughly affirmative action and right. you know multiculturalism, right. diversity, right. And these right. sort of tags that are in right. the public right. discourse? Right, right. Well, we deliberately did not use the phrase affirmative action because it means so many different things to so many different people and has taken on so much baggage that we thought it was better to talk directly about what we're talking about, which is the admission process. Affirmative action, of course includes many other kinds of programs, job programs, contracts, uh, all of that. And one may have one view about those programs and a quite different view about admissions, which is, after all, a bet on the future. And so we really wanted to separate those things out. And if I just may say, I think the public debate would be advanced greatly uh, if more people separated those things. The, the book seems to be playing into that. I mean, there's people who are concerned about these issues, who are reading this book and trying to see how it's going to inform them in this discussion, which is at times pretty hot right now across the country. No, it, it is. And it's not always, as you well know, as informed as it ought to be. I mean, we really did set out uh, not to preach, uh, not to turn the volume way up but to inform, uh, to produce data and evidence on how these students actually did in school and in the game of life. I also thought it was really marvelous how you and Derek Bach have really participated. I mean, you both really have an involvement in talking about this book across the country. Right. Would you like to talk a little bit? Tell you, I tell you one of the most, uh, to me, interesting anecdotal experiences that we had. I was sitting here in my offices in New York getting ready to go to Chicago to talk with a group of trustees at the University of Chicago and Northwestern about the study, and the phone rang. 
and my colleague came into the office and said, there's someone on the phone who insists he is a survivor of your Economics 101 class. I taught Economics 101 every semester, every year I was at Princeton. Survivors always get put through. That's one of the <laughs> rules of the office. And so we put this person through. And he said, President Bowen, he said, my name is Jerry Blakemore. I was in your class, Economics 101, in the fall of 72. Do you remember me? Well, by a miracle, I did. And I said, well, Jerry, how are you? And Jerry said, fine. Jerry, I should explain, he's an African-American from Illinois whose parents had never heard of Princeton when he came there as an undergraduate. He said, the reason I call is that I see you're coming out to Illinois, and I would like to see you while you're here. He said, I am now the chairman of the Board of Higher Education in the state of Illinois, and I would like to arrange for you to speak with our group. And I said, well, Jerry, of course I'll do that if I can. And then he paused, and he said, President Bowen, your book is about me. Your book is about me, and what the success of these African-American students, as reported in the book, says is that, yes, Jerry, it is about you, and there are a lot of Jerry Blakemores out there. And that's been very gratifying to observe at first hand as well as through masses of statistics. What's, what's been the reaction across the country as you've talked about the book? Uh, overall, the reaction has been really um, very favorable. We've had a lot of uh, interested people come and participate in discussions. We've had a lot of good questions. I've learned a lot uh, from the discussion. There's so much more to do. This book is just a beginning. You know, we, we claim no more than that. We hope well, that it's a good the, beginning, but it's no more than a beginning. That's the, one of the questions I was going to ask you. Where do you see this going from here? I mean, you seem to open up a topic well, for national discourse. We, we've tried to do that. We focused on African-American students and white students for statistical reasons, really. They were present in large numbers in the fall of 76. But of course, the question of race in America isn't a black-white question. It's much, much more complex than that. And so we've now commissioned additional research on the Hispanic Latino population. And we hope to study more carefully the Asian Americans and to understand better why they've done so extremely well. And we want to look more carefully at pre-college preparation and how much difference it makes. We want to study in more detail passages in the graduate school. I'm sure that down the road, some strong soul, some sturdy runner, will want to take the database forward. We'll want to re-interview some of these people. We'll want to find out how they've done later in life. So I could spend, somebody could spend a lifetime uh, on this. Hey, how has this affected you and your role with the Mellon Foundation? Um, you know, it seems right, that we've right. changed your thinking about some things. Well, it's certainly sharpened dramatically uh, my understanding of this particular issue because like everyone else I had assumptions and so forth but I didn't have facts either and so I now feel more confident about the kinds of programs that the foundation uh, supports and can support productively both research and programs intended for example to encourage more minority students to earn PhDs so it's certainly affected uh, our grant making and our thinking in that regard. Our trustees, I should add, have been very supportive and are very eager to encourage more research. I give you just one example. Mike Nettles, who is a professor uh, at Michigan, is doing a major study nationally of persistence, of what factors encourage people to stay in school, what factors lead people to drop out of school, and what programs and policies might help us retain a larger fraction of the talented students who start out. Well, we're very pleased to sponsor that project and, you know, many, many others. Earl Lewis, the dean of the graduate school at the University of Michigan, is also deeply concerned about how, how can you address those issues, how can you right. identify them, and how can you come up with solutions well, to them? And, the, you know, the book identifies uh, problems as well as recognizes achievements, tremendous civic contribution, and all the rest. One of the problems that the book identifies is sometimes called academic underperformance. I mean, the fact that African American students do not always do as well academically uh, as we would expect them to do, a phenomenon that no one really understands uh, terribly well. And so we're commissioning a good deal of research, building on the work that Claude Steele has done at Stanford and others have done, uh, to try to understand that better, because it's clearly important that every student, minority student, whites, whatever, 
uh, do as well as that student can do in school. And I think colleges and universities uh, can do better in educating the people um, whom they enroll, and they want to. The other, that's the other gratifying response. The presidents of colleges and universities are eager uh, to hear what's not gone so well as well as what's gone very well. You know, we, each of us wants to do better. You want to make ever better television shows, and these people want to make uh, ever better student bodies and graduate. One of the questions I had as I read the book was about the use of SAT scores. So could you address that, since so often people say that standardized tests aren't an accurate reflection, although they do provide documentation? But it's, it's something that other people want to talk about it. They were concerned about, you know, that aspect right. of it. Well, um, the question of SAT scores and their proper use is a very important question. I suppose I could summarize our view this way. Uh, SAT scores are one useful measure among many, many others. High school grades, what courses a student took, where the student's getting better. Uh, in judging academic potential. And I think myself that they're particularly helpful in helping you know which students are sort of over threshold, which students really have a very good chance of, of making it. But then once you get over a threshold, to be sure, a high threshold, our research in the book shows that the incremental progress, if you want to put it that way, or incremental achievement, uh, doesn't correlate very well with incremental SAT scores. And so you know, the student who got a 1400 SAT score and the student who got a 1300 SAT score, I wouldn't, you know, bet the house <laughs> that the 1400 person is going to do better than the 1300 person. I really wouldn't, and neither would admissions offices. Just, excuse me, just to follow up one second, one of the other, I think, striking findings is that these admission offices are really picking and choosing, and they're turning down lots of students with higher SAT scores, white and black, in and taking students, white and black, with lower test scores because they think that the students they take with the lower test scores have something else to contribute. Well, I, I applaud that. I've never been a believer in slavishly worshiping, you know, how somebody did with a number two pencil, you know, on a cold November day in some test center. I think you did try to adjust for that anomaly in your, your we, analysis. We do. We, we spend a lot of work on the statistics. But I think the general conclusion is clear that, yes, these scores are helpful. They do modestly improve our ability to predict who's going to do what. Uh, but are they the end all and be all? Uh, you know, absolutely not. But who would have ever thought they were? No, the ATS doesn't think that, doesn't claim that. Well, uh, I think many students are trying to enter college are taking these uh, you know, intensifying yeah, workshops yeah. and trying to think that this is a way that's going to help them. And I think well, it's the overall person. I mean, of course, higher scores are better than lower scores. Sure. But there are so many other factors that are important. I mean, what kind of a person you're dealing with? Uh, what the teacher says about this student. When I was teaching Economics 101, all those years. The students whom I really was not happy to have were the high testing students who thought they'd done it all and who had nothing more to learn. How boring. And I really <laughs> wanted to get them out of my class and get into my class. It's people who were going somewhere, who thought they had room to improve and something to learn. They were the people who were fun to teach. Agents for change. Agents for change, exactly. Energy, excited about what they were doing, Pleased to have the opportunity. Those are the people you want. As the composition of the student body changes, what are the long-term implications of that? Well, we're seeing uh, some of it already. One of the findings in the book is that race-sensitive admission policies have contributed uh, in a big way to strengthening, solidifying the black middle class, which is growing. Fortunately, it should be. Uh, more minority students in leadership positions here, there, and everywhere. And one thing we're now beginning to see is the next generation effect. We're beginning to see the children of some of these people who entered these schools in the late 60s, early 70s, enrolling themselves. We're seeing minority alumni children, for That's, example. That is interesting. See, which we didn't see. I mean, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, you just didn't see that. And I think one other subject that deserves a lot more attention than we've been able to give it is intergenerational effects. When you help someone get a higher, better education, uh, the benefits are going to redound to that person's children and to that child's children. This is a kind of long-term process. But, but that applies not only to one race, 
Because I remember reading in the book about how all the people who were involved with this, or many of them, remarked how they felt strengthened and that yeah. their pr perspective was broader. Ab absolutely. There are wonderful vignettes in the book, stories contributed by the people in the study who tell us in their own words how much they learned uh, from having a roommate of a different race or being in a class, a sociology class or whatever with someone who saw the world differently and hadn't had quite the same experiences growing up as I might have had or you might have had. And I think we all know intuitively that we learn most when we talk to people who are different from us. And what the book provides, really for the first time, is a lot of data that Some really footing. support that. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. A statistical underpinning for this common sense observation that sure, Getting to know somebody who's different from you may correct some stereotypes. I think it often does. And I think that's helpful. That is to start providing an undergirding for a, a discussion about multiple. I, 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 I certainly think so. I mean, one of the other just powerful conclusions of the study uh, is that the students who were at these schools during these years, white and black, are strong supporters of these policies, really strong supporters. You know, looking back, uh, they don't want it another way. Almost four out of five of the white students in this study were in favor either of retaining race-sensitive admission policies as they were then being practiced or strengthening them. Only about one in five were in favor of reducing the emphasis. That's not been picked up a lot in the press. No, it hasn't. But I think it's a really important finding. It's important because those people were there. Uh, they saw firsthand what the consequences of this kind of diversity were for them. And so I take that, um, that comment, that evidence, uh, very seriously. I think other people should. What, what has been the comment of other university and college administrators and presidents as they've had a chance to, you know? Well, a lot of them have been um, quite surprised, not so much by the direction of the findings. I mean, most people thought that you would find that these African-American students had done well and were active in civic mm -hmm. events and so forth. But they were surprised by the magnitudes. I mean, just take civic involvement and contribution. Uh, what we find, for example, among holders of MD degrees, doctor's degrees, is that something like 8% of all the white doctors were leaders of civic and community groups. Well, that's, that's pretty good. That's impressive. But 18% of the black doctors were leaders of these kinds of organizations. Now, would I have predicted twice as high a fraction of black doctors at age 38, which is about what these people were when they were interviewed, uh, spending time playing that role? No, I wouldn't have predicted that. And I don't think most college and university presidents uh, would. But I also think that the data on academic performance and the ways we need to improve uh, got people's attention, too. And, and, you know, more generally, I mean, I think one of the messages of the book is that let's talk candidly about how we've done. Let's look at the data. And where it's great, let's celebrate and cheer and say onward. And where we can do better, well, let's do better. I mean, I think that's the way most people want to operate. Don't curse the darkness. You know, light the candle. And that's the shape of the river. That's the shape of the river. Thank you for appearing on our program. Well, thank you so much for this really very interesting, from my perspective, conversation. Thank you. Thank you.